It has been a really good day. I've enjoyed being here with all of you and getting to talk about what it means to be a disciple of our Lord. On September the 11th of 2001, it's a day that all of us will remember because of what happened in New York and what happened in Washington whenever terrorists attacked our country. And in the days and weeks and months and even the few years that followed, we saw our country go to war. Now, during that time, there was maybe some confusion about maybe some of the specifics of some of the objective of that, but at least to some degree, there was one objective that was very clear. We were after those who had attacked us. We wanted to bring to justice those who had attacked. There was a clear, at least in that aspect, a mission objective to defeat the enemy. What is the objective of the church? Do we know what our objective is? Because you see, whether we realize it or not, whether we want to be or not, we are at war. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. For your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We are in a war. Our enemy doesn't care about fighting fair. He doesn't care who gets hurt. As a matter of fact, if more people get hurt, all the better. We are at war. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Paul speaks about this war. And the, the verses there, the passage that follows on after this, he gets into detail about this war. But specifically, verses 10 through 12 in Ephesians 6, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. The fact is, we are at war. We have a very real and a very dangerous enemy. What is the objective of that war? What is the point? What are we after? Do we know what our objective and what our purpose is? Because when we look at passages like Ephesians chapter 6, it makes it abundantly clear that we are in a war but when we get to thinking about the objective and the purpose and what we're after, we have to be careful that we don't confuse our mission objective with the enemy that we fight against. You know, if we ask the question, who's our enemy? If you go out on the street and you ask, who's our enemy? Well, you're going to get a number of different answers. If somebody's thinking nationally, they're going to start naming off people that are citizens of countries on the other side of the world. Who's our enemy? Well, in an election year, somebody might tell you somebody in the opposite party. They might tell you one of the front runners in the presidential election. That's the enemy. Who's the enemy? It might be the person that's competing for the promotion that I want at work. Who's the enemy? Paul says, our war, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Now don't, don't mistake me here. The, the enemy can certainly use people against us. People can do the bidding of the enemy, but people are not the enemy. The people that we encounter are the mission. That's the objective. We are at war in the objective. What both sides want, what both sides want, the souls of man. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, Jesus said, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God paid the highest price for the souls of man, and He wants every person saved. 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that He doesn't want any to perish. 1 Timothy 2, 1-4 says that God wants everyone to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The objective is the souls of man, but we've got an enemy that has the same objective except his, his desire is to destroy. 
God paid the highest price. And Satan works tirelessly for the souls of mankind. We are at war. And in that war, as we've been talking about Jesus as our Savior, we've been talking about Jesus as the one that we follow as our leader. He's our king, but he is also our commander. When we think about it from this, uh, from this analogy of we are at war, the fact that we are at war, he is the one that calls the shots, and he has given us our marching orders. He has given us his command. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to be talking about how if we follow after Jesus, if we are his disciples then we are to go make disciples. To bring more people to the only place, to the only one who can save. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 28. Read a passage that I'm sure we've all heard a number of times, but we're going to spend some time looking at that as well as some others this afternoon. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, "'All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth.'" Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The command of our King. He gives a command. It is an imperative when He says, Make disciples. And it's based on what he says there, all authority, he says, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now let's think about that for just a minute. The authority that Jesus has. He says, all authority has been given to me. If Jesus has all authority, how much does that leave for the rest of us? How much right do we have to push back and say, well, you know, I don't, I don't really want to do that. But it's hard, Jesus. It's difficult. It's scary. I don't know how people are going to respond. All authority. As a result of that, Jesus said, make disciples. We have to go out in order to do it. We have to go in order to do it. Because the church, as we think about a church that is at war, the church is not a social club for our comfort. Oh, we love getting together. We love to fellowship. We love to do fun things together, get together and have meals and play games and enjoy each other's company. And we need to build our relationships with one another through our time together. But we have an objective. We have a purpose. We have a reason, uh, a job to do, a reason that we are in existence. The church is not a social club just for our comfort. It isn't an exclusive group for only those that are like us. Because our Lord wants all to be saved. That's not limited to people that think like us or act like us. And we use this passage in Matthew 28 whenever we talk about world missions, and we absolutely should. Well, you know, we think about the mission that God gives, the mission of God to bring people to Himself. It covers more than just the missionaries that are supported around the world. Go make disciples. Of all the nations, includes our own. Within that command, we find the marching orders, the command, the authority to send resources so that disciples can be made around the world, but we also see the imperative that's in our own backyard. It covers more than just all the nations that are out there. It covers the people that we encounter from day to day. And so when he says to go, that is necessary to make disciples. It means to go across the ocean, missionary support. Go across the street to your neighbor that you know who doesn't know Jesus. But it also means, maybe sometimes, across the dinner table to the next generation to teach our children to train them up to know and to love Jesus. When we think about a spiritual war, we think a, a lot of times about being on the defense against Satan's attacks. You know, we talked about the other day, we were talking about using the sword of the Spirit and being trained in it, learning in order to be trained in it so that we can go on the offense against the enemy. To draw back those that are lost in sin that Satan has to bring people back to God who are lost in sin.
Mission objective is to bring people to Christ. When we think of that spiritual war, it's not just putting on the armor for defense. It's taking up the sword to share the message of Jesus. This is how we go on the offense to take what Satan has that God desires. The plan that he has for that mission is for you and for me to speak up. God has designed the church to perpetuate, to continue to train people in the next generation, to teach people in the next generation. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul told Timothy, "...the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also." The design of the church is that we prepare people, we teach people about Jesus in the next generation, but we not only teach people the message of Jesus, we teach people so that they can then teach more to go generation to generation to generation because Jesus Christ is the only one who can save and if we don't train people to keep on training people, it's only going to be a generation or two before we're in trouble. We have the mission. We have the marching order. We have the command of Jesus to go out and make disciples. But who does He give that command to? Go make disciples. We like to think about that a lot of times in terms of the missionaries that we send, we'll charge them, go make disciples. and Well, they need to. But it's broader than that. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 8. And we're going to see that making disciples, teaching the gospel in action in a very specific context. And we see it all the way through the book of Acts, but I want to, look at, I want to focus in on one very specific uh, example of this. In Acts 8... Verses 3 and 4 is where we're going to look in just a moment. But in this context, Stephen in chapter 7 has preached before the Jews, and they've gotten angry with him, and he's been stoned. And you remember it says that they laid the, their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Saul of Tarsus, later the Apostle Paul, is there. And after all of this happens, there's this great persecution that breaks out against the church. And it tells us that Saul, is, he ravaged the church. He's entering house after house. He's dragging men and women off. He's doing everything he can to put an end to the church. Verse 3, Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about preaching. Those who had been scattered. Well, who was scattered? Verse 1, That day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. The apostles weren't scattered. Those who were went out preaching. And so inasmuch as it is the job of leadership within the church to preach, what this tells us is that it's beyond just the minister and the elders it is the job of every child of God to proclaim the message of Jesus, to tell people what Jesus has done, to tell people how He has affected you, to tell people that He's the only way to heaven, to tell people the good news, to share the love of Jesus because God wants everyone to know Him. That's your job and my job. They took the message with them. They went out because of persecution. Now, we're not in the same way really persecuted today. But you know, every week as we go out to our various jobs, we go to our families and to our neighborhoods, the church scatters throughout this area. Are we taking the message with us? Are we taking the message to our friends and neighbors that don't know Him? The church scattered and they took the gospel. Sharing Jesus is a church-wide activity. It's not just for those that we think of as leaders. Those that were scattered, it wasn't the apostles, those that were scattered went out sharing the good news. That's for everyone. Go, make disciples, Jesus says. That means me. And that means you. Disciples make disciples. Because the one we follow has commanded it. 
But we are wanting to make disciples as well because it is a matter of life and death. Making disciples is not just, well, it's just something that we do. We tell people about Jesus because it sounds like a good idea. We tell people about Jesus because it is a matter of life and death. In Romans chapter 6, in verse 23, Paul says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death. The question that we all have to ask ourselves, do we really believe it? Now it's easy to, on the surface, oh yeah, I believe it. But do we really believe that the people out there in sin that don't know Jesus are in danger, are in trouble? beyond what they could possibly fathom? Do we really believe that those who die outside of Christ are doomed to an eternity apart from God? In John chapter 14, in verses 1 through 6, Jesus is telling His followers, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in Me. And He says, I'm going to prepare a place. I'm going to go, I'm going to prepare a place, and I'm going to come back and get you. And you know the way to where I'm going. Well, Thomas doesn't really know what he's talking about. And he says to him, Lord, what are you talking about? We don't, how do we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus is the only way to salvation. Only through knowing Him. Only through being connected to Him. Having our sins washed away in Him. Do we have any hope? Telling people about Jesus, making disciples of our Lord is a matter of life and death. You know, our world has this concept that heaven is for good people. As long as I've done enough good deeds, was liked well enough, donated enough money to a good cause, you fill in the blank, whatever, however someone, and you see this as subjective across our society, however someone would define someone else as good. That's not what the Bible says. Heaven is for those who are united with Jesus. That place is prepared for those who know Jesus. Heaven is for those who are in Christ. Because the wages of sin is death, and He's the only one that can take the sin away. Telling people about Jesus. Going to make disciples of Jesus is a matter of life and death. It is imperative that we understand the consequence of it. Because if we don't understand the consequence, the people out there who don't know Him won't have hope. We are in a war for the souls of mankind. And it is a matter of life and death. Because, as it says in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, there is salvation in no one else. There's no other name under heaven that's been given among men whereby we must be saved. Career advancement can't save you. Financial security can't save you. And as much as they may want you to believe otherwise, your favorite politician can't save you. We chase after all sorts of things that make no eternal difference at all. The only thing that's going to matter when we end, when this life ends is where we stand with God through Jesus Christ. It's why Paul, turn with me if you will to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Wow, this was the one thing that Paul focused on. This was the one thing that he made a priority. In 1 Corinthians 9, 16 and following. Or excuse me, 19 uh, and following. He says, For though I am free from all men, I've made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I may win the Jews. To those under the law as under the law, though not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law as without law, though not being without the law of God, 
and under the law of Christ, so that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I've become all things to all men, so that by all means I may save some. Paul says, this is the only thing that matters and I'll do anything that it takes to bring someone to Jesus. If it'll bring someone to Christ, it doesn't matter how much effort it takes. It doesn't matter how hard it is. It's worth it. Because at the end of this life, that's all that matters. That's the only thing that will be important is where we stand with Christ. And the blessings of Christ... You know, Jeremiah predicted that a new covenant was going to come. A covenant in which sins will be remembered no more. But the covenant blessings are only for those who are part of that new covenant. It's only for those who are in covenant with God through Jesus Christ. Brethren, telling people about Jesus following that command of Jesus, that imperative to make disciples is a matter of life and death. It's the most significant thing that we can engage in. But it's not always an easy command to follow. We look around at our world and we see that our society has grown less Uh, in a lot of ways, less friendly to the truth. Well, it's going to be difficult. I don't know how somebody's going to respond. Will they be interested? Will they not be interested? Maybe they'll get upset. There's the question of how will this affect the relationship? Maybe this will end a friendship. Maybe this will cause problems. How is this going to work? It's not easy. But Christ gives us reassurance along with the command. Turn back with me, if you will, to Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to look again at the command that Jesus gave, but specifically what else he says along with that command. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all I commanded you. And so he gives the instructions, teach them, baptize them, teach them everything, make disciples. That's tough. Especially if you're, if you're an introvert like me. That's hard to do, but he gives a great comfort Because the very end of that passage, he says, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. We don't go into the mission alone. Our Lord goes with us. You know, growing up, I remembered hearing several times the the prayer, Lord, bless the efforts that we make as we try to affect our community. But we have to be making efforts for the Lord to bless them. And sometimes I'm convinced that we struggle to make those efforts because we're, we're concerned about the difficulty. We're concerned about what the reaction will be. The Lord doesn't send us out alone. He gives us a comfort. But you know, I'm thankful as I look around here, and I've been over the last, you know, at least several weeks, for a few months actually, talking to Jonathan, and he's told me about people here who have been actively inviting people to come hear the gospel. He's been talking with me about a number of people who have been putting in an effort toward this purpose. Let's keep going with that. Just because someone says no, move on to the next person, ask someone else, talk to someone else, keep making efforts. Ask, are there, is there another method we can use? Is there another way? Is there someone else that I can approach? Start looking around for opportunity. But you know, when we think about that command to go and make disciples of all the nations, it can get a bit overwhelming because we look around and go, well, you know, this is a big town. This is a big city. It's a big area. There's people everywhere. How do I obey that command? Well, to make it a little bit less overwhelming, start with where it's familiar. 
Because every one of us is carrying around some kind of a phone, some kind of a device that has lots of names in it. I suspect that every one of you has a name of at least a person or two in there that you know, that you're in contact with, who doesn't know Jesus. Go make disciples of the nations. Starts with sharing the gospel with someone. Find someone that you know. Look through if you need to. Go through your phone. Find someone that you know that needs to hear the gospel and take the first step of praying for that person by name. Praying for an opportunity. Praying for their heart to be softened. Praying that they'll be receptive. Praying for your eyes to be open that you'll see opportunity to begin sharing, to begin demonstrating the love of Christ in order to prepare the way to share the good news. Pray for opportunity and then look for it. Look for opportunity to show the love of Jesus to them and the opportunity to tell them about Him. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 the Apostle Paul speaks about the work of those sharing as well as the work of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and following, he says, What then is Apollos? What's Paul? Servants through whom you believed, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God was causing the growth. So then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field, God's building. Let's trust that God will continue to give the increase. Because as Jesus said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That means he's still with us when we go out. Whenever we do our job to plant and to water, He's still ready to give the increase. He's still ready to bring people because He still has the same desire that everyone come to Him. It involves telling people what God did for you through Christ. One of my teachers at Sunset put it at one time. You know, we go out and tell people about Jesus. A lot of times it involves, one, it involves teaching them what the Scripture says, but it also involves showing them how He's transformed you and me. Or as Jerry Tallman said at one time, that evangelism is just one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread. He took my sin away and He can take yours away too. You open up the Scripture to share. Here's what the Bible says. Here's who He is. We're to follow after Jesus. It means that we understand who He is and what He's done. It means that we understand the significance of the sacrifice He's made. It means that we understand that this is a matter of life and death that we are, in, uh, we are in a war, and the message that we have is of eternal significance to every person. We are under the command to go make disciples. But it requires that we redefine, in a lot of cases, how we see ourselves. We are in the midst of a war with a clear mission, a clear objective, Jesus died. He paid the highest price for the souls of man. Satan does everything he can to destroy the souls of man. God has given us the mission to go and share the good news of Jesus, which is the only way to save. He's given you that mission and me that mission. So when we think about missionaries, we tend to think about the people that we sent to a country in Asia or Africa or South America. But God has planted His missionaries in this church right here in Albany, Oregon. He's given us the mission of sharing. You know, in Puyallup, when we talk about missionaries, a lot of times it comes up those that we support in places like Guyana or the Philippines or in Mexico. 
But we've begun just talking about Mission Puyallup, trying to redefine how we think about missions, that we live on the mission field, but here you have Mission Albany, a group of missionaries that meet here every week and interact with people that are lost, people that don't know Jesus every week. We have to start seeing ourselves as, the, as God's missionaries to this town. Being a missionary doesn't just mean moving to another country. It means sharing the message with the lost. Being a part of God's mission. Or if you want to think about being a missionary as going somewhere other than home, well, let's think about the song we sing. You know, I was talking earlier about the theology that we have in our music. Well, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through, so... Well, this isn't home, so let's understand we are missionaries where we're at and trying to take as many people as we can with us to be in the presence of our Lord for all of eternity, to have a citizenship in heaven. Are we ready to enter that mission? Are we ready to make that a part of who we are? Not just some event or activity that we do, but it's part of who we are is to go out and to try to share the good news with someone. To look for opportunity to share the good news with someone. To tell the truth. We're going to sing an invitation song here in just a moment. But I'd like you to think about that mission. God's mission is to save as many as He can. He sent Jesus here for that purpose. Jesus said, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you're not a New Testament Christian, He wants you to be part of His family. He wants you to have your sins washed away. He wants you to be in fellowship with Him. If you are a Christian, that's the message you have to share to anyone and everyone you can. But today, if you're not a Christian, that's the message you need to understand. And that you have opportunity today to be part of God's family. You have opportunity today if you'll come sharing your belief in Jesus. That you believe that He is who He says He is, the Son of God. Choose to turn away from your sins and be connected, united with Him in the waters of baptism. Your sins will be washed away. You'll receive His Spirit to dwell within you. To testify along with your spirit that you are His child and His heir with hope. Or today, if maybe you've, you're thinking, I've, I've struggled to share. I've struggled to be part of that mission that God calls me in. And you'd like to study further. You'd like the prayers of the church in order to commit yourself to fulfilling the purpose that God has for you, to share His love. We'd be glad to help you in any way that we can. Whether you want to become a Christian or you want to commit yourself to fulfilling the mission that God has given us as Christians. And if we can assist you in that, we'd invite you to come right now while together we stand and sing.